Hi, Shannon Waller here, and welcome to this very special author interview with a very, very good friend of mine that I have had the honor and pleasure of spending time with, and I'll talk about the context of that in just a moment. And he's someone who is not only a very successful businessman with his partner, Brian, but also has developed what we would call a self-managing company that has really freed him up to do something that he's incredibly passionate about. So I'm super excited because, as everyone knows, I'm very passionate about teams and how we work together. And what I love, Jim, is that you have taken a concept that is very much applies to companies but brought it home. And since one of the most important teams we have available to us is, in fact, our families, this is kind of a neat and slightly different tie-in, which I really appreciate. Let me just give you a little bit more context as well. So one of the reasons why I'm interviewing Jim is that he has written a book called The Family Board Meeting. And it's not the boring kind of board meeting most of us are familiar with. This one involves surfboards, which I really love, which I really appreciate. So, Jim, thank you so much for joining me. And I'm really excited to talk about board meetings and connecting with our kids as part of our bigger teams. No, I appreciate it, Shannon. Thanks for having me. And I will be telling the audience that you are now a surfer because I've been out in the ocean with you a few times now. And I saw you surf waves and I actually have video footage to prove it. Yeah, you're going to need that. (laughs) I'm not sure when it will happen again unless I'm with you. (laughs) But it was quite the experience. So I'll just set up how we met each other, and I'm very grateful for Jim reaching out to me. So we were both a couple of years ago at Jason Ganyard's Mastermind Talks. And I didn't know very many people there, and I had my time slot figured out. And it was really an amazing group of people that were there, both speaking and attending. And I'm staying at the back of the room feeling, frankly, somewhat uncomfortable. And you, Jim, came up and introduced yourself to me, and we connected. And I just feel so grateful for you reaching out because, A, you made the Mastermind Talks experience that much richer, and I started feeling a little bit more at home. But then also, I got to find out what you do as a passion and as a living. So thank you for doing that. That was not something that everyone would have done. No, thank you. It was easy because you have a good smile, and that's probably one of the biggest invites to talk to a person. Thank you. (laughs) It goes to you. (laughs) I love that. Thank you. Now, just to set up kind of what you do and what kind of an entrepreneur you are, if you could talk about your business that you have with Brian, because I think actually that's a huge part of the success of your life and obviously gives context to how we create deep connections with our families. Talk about you and Brian and your business for a moment. Brian and I are quite an enigma. We grew up together since the age of three, through college together, and just have a, a, quite a history together. And, and about 15 years ago, we started to really get the entrepreneurial bug, and we said, let's start doing some real estate and buying and fixing houses. And it started small, and long story short, it snowballed after a few successes and lots of lessons and lots of failures and lots of lessons. But we built a real estate investment company that started in California and now is here in Florida. And that was pretty much the leveraging point to get us to be able to get really involved in entrepreneur events, personal development events, and eventually how I met you. So real estate is our core business. Real estate investments have always been nothing sexy. I think they say you should have your niche within one sentence. And if I could do that, we buy single-family home foreclosures. It's what we've done always. I don't do big commercial buildings. I don't do apartments. We're just after hundreds and hundreds of deals getting good at the single-family homes, I joke. So that's our business, and it allowed us to really get into our passion, which Brian and I discovered was working with entrepreneur families. Getting into this game pretty young, I was in an interesting situation where I was closer to the kids' age of entrepreneurs I was working with than the actual entrepreneurs when I first went into this in my early 20s. And I could see a real disconnection between successful entrepreneurs and their children a lot of the time, which we'll talk about today, and there were ways to avoid it. And we just started to work with entrepreneur families in fun ways that we knew how. We're surfers. We love the ocean. And we thought we'd just share our passions with others, but do it in a very kind of Mr. Miyagi way, but a lot funner than painting fences. <laughs> and it seemed to work. And you've been a part of that, Shannon, now, as you know. So our real estate business feeds our passion business. And that's been a huge blessing. We couldn't do what we did without it. And we look to get more into our passion business. 
but with every bit of appreciation and respect for our core business, which is real estate investment. Mm, fantastic. And the real estate business, which I think is actually kind of sexy, so <laughs> <laughs> mostly because I'm on the outside. To me, it's something that's always been of interest. But I really have such respect also for your success there, but also how you and Brian have connected both in that business and in this one, which is really supporting entrepreneurs, as you talked about, families. And our audience listening is both entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial team members who often, by the way, have exactly the same challenges as their entrepreneurs do, too much to do, too little time, trying to always balance the work and family dynamic. And how you guys have really had your own experience, but your own experience and your own wisdom and your own lessons that you have then packaged for the rest of us, both in the book and in your board meeting retreats. Before I jump into some of that, I also want to give kind of a really cool thing that you just mentioned was that you'll be speaking at Harvard very shortly <laughs> in the next couple of days. So tell us a little bit more about that. Well, first and foremost, my parents joked that there are substitute teachers from third grade rolling over in their grave right now. I hate to say that, but <laughs> it is definitely a little odd that the wild ADD boy is going to Harvard to speak. But it's an honor, and I'm very excited about it. And I think people are starting to see the, the overall success. And I know that's something, Shannon, that you've worked with a lot with Strategic, and it's a full package now. And I think we bring an important part in where I'm going to actually be doing a talk for the first time. It's something I have honestly been working on for years called Looking Behind the Curtain. And the talk is really going to force some people to look inward and look behind their own curtain at the success of not only their business and their balance sheet, but their home life. The thing I'm seeing very clearly now is we are in a world of marketing perfection. And marketing is phenomenal because it gets the word out. It's how I've indirectly met you. But the thing I've seen is we can all look like the great and powerful Oz. But who's the man behind the curtain? Social media and marketing platforms can make us look great. But behind the curtain, certain things can suffer. And the thing that I focus on, that Brian and I focus on, is the family life. And I actually, my talk, to give you guys a sneak peek, will be tied back to the Wizard of Oz and that lesson. We all remember, I'm sure you've seen the movie plenty of times, Shannon, I'd imagine. Oh, yes. Love it. <laughs> yep. Growing up, we all saw it. And the lesson stuck a little bit when little Toto ran and opened up the curtain, and we found a con man from Omaha behind there, not the great and powerful Oz. What really connected for me getting into this at, a, again, a young age and having some success with the real estate, I got invited to speak at some pretty cool events in some pretty cool areas around the world. And what I saw from being backstage, from being behind the curtain, instead of in the audience, for some of the other people speaking who were further down the road than me, much more successful, bigger balance sheet, was something that didn't match what I saw on stage. Their great and powerful Oz on stage was not what it would match up to be behind the curtain. And that really stuck with me. And it was something that, frankly, it kind of haunted me, because I didn't want to be like that. Mm -hmm. So I will be talking about Jonathan and Rick up at Harvard. And do you want to hear about Jonathan and Rick? Is that sure, just, just a little bit. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, let's start with Jonathan. Jonathan, very successful, has four houses in different areas, beautiful areas around the world. Uh, he's just been interviewed for a big magazine, and he was sitting in a position of power with his hands crossed, looking very confident. His talk was impeccable, perfect, and his balance sheet was undeniable. But when I got backstage and got to meet these people up close and a little more personal, I found out that Jonathan was also going through his third divorce. He had five children with his three different wives, who, frankly, his children didn't know him and they had no desire to get to know him. He had pretty much dropped all of his relationships of even close friends that were good people to stay with and stay in contact with in the name of progress for his business. He had become paranoid. He had become bitter. And frankly, it was very clear that he's extremely lonely. Mm. And it's interesting as you talk about that, because is it a compilation of people or is that one person? It, it is. It's a compilation of people. I mean, there's some that stick out, and obviously I'm changing the names. but it, To protect it, the guilty. <laughs> yes, exactly. And we're all this kind of guilty, you know, when we look behind the curtain. And, you know, I remember hearing reverse role models can be one of our best teachers, and the Jonathans were. And then the positive role models were the Ricks. And Rick had the same size business operation, a large business operation. But unlike Jonathan, he had date night every week with his wife. He was totally in love with her. His children not only knew him, but he knew the names of the children's best friends. 
They went on a vacation almost every six weeks. He rarely missed some event or sporting event. He would be there. And where Jonathan was sending a proxy to his son's soccer game and saying that he had to sacrifice his family in order to make the business successful, Rick would say to me, in order for my business to be successful, I had to have this priority in time with my family. And that was very interesting to see that there were two approaches to it, and both got them to business success in the big balance sheet, but obviously one was way more fulfilling than the other. Well, I love that because I've met Jonathan and I've met Rick. (laughs) (laughs) So I know exactly the type of person you're talking about. I think a lot of people do think it's an either or. We would call that a scarcity mindedness rather than abundance mindedness. So either or versus both and. And Rick definitely has both and. He doesn't have to sacrifice one for the other. But that's an assumption that a lot of people in business have, both successful executive, particularly entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial team leaders, entrepreneurial team members. They think they have to give up something really, really important, if we were to pay attention to it, in order for business success. But you're saying that that doesn't have to happen. And that's part of what we're going to talk about your, I'm not going to call it formula, but the process. But I want to go back to talking about the cost, because you talk a lot in your book, which I really appreciate. There's a big lie of entrepreneurship. There's a cost to thinking the way that the Jonathans think about things. So talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, well, the Jonathans are not bad people. They've just taken their training to a different level, and they've let some bad information in. One of the things is a hero of mine is Dr. Ned Hollowell, who I talk about through the book and has really taken the science approach to the importance of connection. And connection is such a strong force that studies have been shown that those who lack connection with their closest people in their life, it's worse for them than smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. Wow which is just absolutely incredible. But we've been taught with that go, 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 that tenacity to achieve that we can't have both. And that's just absolutely wrong. Um, The connection is something that you should not only give focus on, but do it without guilt or remorse. And that's the big problem with the Jonathans. They actually feel guilty when they're taking time for connection. And then the other thing that the Jonathans do, Shannon, is improper delegation. And this is something that you and I were talking about delegation before the interview. There are certain things of delegation that I think are good, that I like to do, like someone help clean my house, someone help keep up part of the yard. You know, we give some yard work to our boys, but we have someone come in and help with that so I can spend more quality time. But delegation can be over-abused at home, where a busy entrepreneur can try to delegate their entire family life, and it just does not work. Again, that example of sending a proxy to your son's soccer game, that sounds just so outlandish, but it literally gets to that level, and it just doesn't work. You've totally sacrificed connection, and there's no way you can have a balanced family life. It just doesn't work. Well, I couldn't agree more. And the proxy sounds horrible, by the way, to me, like cringing <laughs> as you talk about it. But I've seen so many, and I have been guilty of this occasionally by myself, is I'll be at the game looking at my phone. Yes. I mean, this is a few years ago when my daughters were younger, but sometimes I'm watching them run down the field looking at their fingernails. <laughs> they were quite young at this point, but still, it was like not the most stimulating soccer game. But because I'm distractible, I'm trying to look up at the field, trying to look down my phone, trying to look up at the field, trying to look down my phone. So I'm distractible. I'm there in body only. And I'm yes. not fully present, so I don't do that anymore, by the way. But it's one of those things where it's like, and then I'd look at other parents and I'd be, oh, what are they doing? And then I'm like, oh, that's me over there. So I put my phone away. But it was hard. We're so tied to our friends, our electronic friends. We're so tied to habits. The whole mindset you talk about, which is we think we have to do it that way Mm. in order to be successful, but that's not true. No, not at all. Not at all. And electronics, as you know, is one of the main rules with our board meeting strategy, which the family board meeting in our ebook is all about. The use of electronics is allowing you and I to connect a lot of the time, Shannon. Mm -hmm. But it can be abused. And it can absolutely be a hindrance to having a deeper, more connected family. And there are plenty of studies and supports, and I have plenty of experiences with the people that have gone through our retreats to see that. And we have to be able to put it in its proper place, because if we don't, it can run all over you. I think that's so true. And I want to jump now to one of your key points, because I'm sure we'll be cycling through these a couple of times. You have really three steps to connection which I think are absolutely critical. 
So I'm just going to say what they are, and then I want to delve into each one deeply. So sure. the first is to be one-on-one with your child, which is awesome. Second is have no electronics, which means both of you may go through withdrawal, especially if you have a teenager, <laughs> like <laughs> I do. And number three, do a fun activity of the child's choosing with focused reflection. And I'll, we'll talk about what that means. So let's, before we jump more into no electronics, let's talk about the importance of having one-on-one with your child. Because if we have more than one child or just lots of other stuff going on. We think we're being great parents because we provide a great social life for our kids and we've got lots of great families with friends. Why is it important to have one-on-one time with your kid? Well, a couple of reasons. This one is almost the most obvious but the most overlooked of our board meeting strategy, the one-on-one time. Because we think, oh, we have a lot of family time, we have a lot of time together, and that's great. But you have to separate the parts to create a stronger whole kids start to develop individuality at the age of nine. And none of us, I've never met one parent where I joke around at an event or at our retreat and say, who wants to have the next Jan Brady? No one raises their hand to Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. You don't want that middle child syndrome of kid who just doesn't feel who they know who they are. And one of the biggest defenses from that and offenses to help create their individuality is one-on-one time. It's sad, Shannon, but you start to see when you interview parents and you say, have you ever been completely alone? If they have four or five kids and they say, wow, you know, I don't think I have. Mm. So one-on-one time, you know, I also like to joke about this where you said you have teenagers. Parents say, well, I want my child to open up to me about deeper subjects. I said, okay, great. So when's the last time that your teenage daughter came to you and said, mom, I'd like to talk to you about puberty but I insist that we do it in front of my little brother, please. <laughs> not going to happen. <laughs> Awkward enough. Do you really want the little giggling brother there? Absolutely not. So one-on-one time gives not only absolute focus, and kids get that feeling that they're going to be heard when they're one-on-one automatically from setting that stage, but it sets the stage to also let them open up about things they never would want to do in a group, and we wouldn't want to do, but we forget that. As you're talking, what I'm remembering is when I had one-on-one time with my dad, there are a few things that he and I would do together. So one is we would often go camping, which in my case involves canoeing. So it's a fair bit of preparation. But he and I would do camping trips together. Those are precious to me. And then I jokingly said I wanted him to take me traveling. So when I was 18, I said this when I was 16. I said, hey, Dad, I want you to take me away. So when I was 18, he took me to Quebec City. And when I was 21, he took me to New York City. And from a kid from Toronto, that was a big deal. Absolutely. But I'm so grateful. I mean, I can tell you what we did. I can tell you what kind of restaurants we ate at. I can definitely tell you the type of people we saw. And it was fabulous because the fact that I was worthwhile enough to take a trip and be one-on-one with him and go exploring, just he and I created a really deep relationship that we wouldn't have had otherwise. And since he's no longer here, I'm just, again, so appreciative of having that connection because... Otherwise, it could have just been a blur. It could have been always the four of us, my mom or my stepmom and my sister, and he, and I wouldn't have had those precious memories that I have now. Exactly. And it's beautiful how you say that, Shannon, because obviously with something going back a few years, it marked the times. And we all say, geez, it's going by so quickly. It's that, mm. that marking of the times is timeless. Yeah. And it was because you were one-on-one. Again, it sets the stage for the deepest connection, one-on-one time. And until people actually practice it and then they email back and say, holy cow, I had no idea what I was missing. And what the child remembers, like you just said, as a perfect example, it comes out. This principle is as strong as gravity. It really is. Mm. Well, my thought right now is that you get to know them as people. Absolutely. Not just as your kid, which is kind of a label. It's a thing. And you get to know them as an individual, their likes, their dislikes, whether or not they're morning people or not, and what thoughts are going through their head. And you don't get it unless you're one-on-one with them. I love it. And as I say in our book, it's the magnifying glass approach. It really magnifies your understanding of them, your relationship, and how you look at them. And man, what a blessing that is. And something that might be hard for us to explain, but both you and I going through it, being on the phone together, we know. And hopefully the people listening will get to know Mm -hmm. by using it. So I want to jump in because, again, we'll, we'll cycle through lots of different things. So I had the opportunity to go with my eldest daughter, Madison, to a board meetings retreat, which was spectacular. I loved every second of it. Also, just getting to hang out with you and Brian 
and the other amazing group of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial families I got to spend time with was that, even before we got to the content of what we were doing, was great. But that time traveling with her, and it actually has set up, because that was a while ago now, it has set up some other adventures. We've gone on other trips. I took her to London with me not that long ago. And we have this connection through, frankly, some very challenging times that has been so incredibly important for us. And I think that unless I had had that time with her at the board meetings retreat, that we would not have been as strong or stable as we are now. So just from my heart to you, I'm so grateful for that coaching and for the insistence that, no, don't bring your whole family, just bring one kid, it was so relevant and so useful for me. And I really appreciate it. As you know, that when we get down to the deepest purpose and passions, when I hear that Brian and I and our board meetings retreats were able to help deepen the connection between you and your daughter, it doesn't get any better. Honestly, it doesn't for me. That's deepest purpose for me. It means the world, so I appreciate that. But again, the credit has to really go to you. We just create the space. We have some good teaching around it, but you have had the commitment to take the time, to book the flights, to come down, and it is a commitment. And now you're reaping the benefit because you've dug that deeper foundation with her. So when things did get windy, you were able to weather through, mm -hmm. and it makes such a difference. So you really have to give the credit to yourself, to your husband, Bruce, who supported it and is joining us at the next one, which I can't wait. Yeah, I can't wait. Yes. <laughs> but honestly, credit comes to you because, again, as entrepreneurs, we forget some things right in front of us. We'll get on a plane for one of our biggest clients or investors at the drop of a hat, mm -hmm. but we won't do it for our child sometimes where people say, oh, fly my kid down to Florida. And you said, great, I'm in. But some people, <laughs> they don't see it. And I say, wow, you'll get it once you're here. That's for sure. <laughs> well, it, yes. And thank you very much, first of all. The other thing is, I may have the intention or I want to do it, but one of the things I really appreciate, not being a naturally structured person myself, is that you provide the structure, you provide the prompt, you provide the environment and the learning and the atmosphere to deepen that connection. So I can want to do it, and I would have said I had a pretty good relationship already, but you add so much to it. So it's co-created. Let's agree on that part. Because I, again, I can want to do it, and I can think I have certain skills and talents, but you certainly added those in an exponential way. So both of us have very fond meetings, and both Madison and I are very excited about Bruce and my other daughter, Charlotte, going down. So we're looking forward to hearing what they come up with. So one-on-one -on -one makes a ton of sense. And then your second point, as it says, have no electronics, which we've talked a little bit about. Now, I want some coaching for you. For those listeners who have teenage kids who are addicted to their phones as much as we are, if not more so, or tweens, <laughs> as, yeah. I do, as I do, what's the conversation like about not bringing electronics with you? As you know, for both our board meeting strategy, which each person who's listening out there, you're going to understand how to use it by the end of this interview, that mm -hmm. I promise you. And our retreats are built on the exact same principles, the same philosophy where it's one parent, one child, without electronics, and then a fun activity with focused reflections. They match each other. You can do them at home, and then you come to us for more of the super version. Mm -hmm. But the electronics, Shannon, the more I read about it, the more I get concerned about the things that are right in front of us and can be doing more harm than good, especially for teenagers. My wife, Jamie, who I know you're friends with as mm, well, lovely. she said to make sure that I said hello to you today, <laughs> obviously was asking about you. She's been a huge part of the board means, a huge teacher for me because she was trained in both Montessori and Waldorf education. And she introduced me to a book called Simplicity Parenting that actually was written by a psychologist who worked in third world military regime areas with refugees. So he worked a lot with post-traumatic stress disorder with children and the symptoms and how it actually progressed into worse things. And when he came and started practicing in first world countries, in Australia and America, teenagers, especially who were overindulged in electronics, showed the exact same signs of post-traumatic stress disorder, proven, which is absolutely crazy when you think about it. So we're actually overstimulating our kids to the point of, post-traumatic stress disorder. And that's one of the reasons why if we can take little breaks and regenerate, we don't burn ourselves out. Mm -hmm. I think that's so critical. And I think when the promise of having one-on time with the parent and they get to choose the activity, which I'm sure that feels a little risky for some parents. So talk about why that's important. 
Well, getting the electronics to be put away are key, and again, that's going to be something that you might have to work on, but again, you set the example first, because you might be just as bad as your teen. (laughs) (laughs) But with that comes some trust where you say you're going to do it, but then picking the activity. A lot of parents, let's start again with teens, because the T word is, oh my gosh, but teens won't do this. Look, teens want to be heard. They want to be appreciated. They want to have fun. And this strategy allows them to do that. But we need to give them ownership. I mean, people support what they help create. And teens are no different. That's why you allow them to choose the activity. Because sometimes we might think we know what they want to do and say, hey, why don't we go do this? And they might say, okay, they're just trying to please you, but they don't really want to do that. You let them choose. You let them create. You let them make the agenda. And by giving them that ownership, teens that might be like, oh, I don't really want to hang out with mom and dad, it opens up a new door. Mm-hmm. And you have a great example from your own family of just how important this time together has been. Can you please talk about Alden for just a moment? Because I think that's pretty spectacular. Sure, sure. So the board meeting strategy, again, really was something that I created with my entrepreneur surf buddies to make sure that we never became a Jonathan and remained a Rick. I entered family life in a very different way than most. My wife, who I just spoke about, was divorced with full custody of two young boys. I mean, I fell in love with her instantly, and we just hit it off famously, and then the boys and I did as well. But Alden especially, being the older one, he had some trust issues for some stuff that he had seen and not a great situation. So rightfully so, he had some trust situations. So when I first came on the scene, Alden was doing horrible in school and close to failing. He had just been put on the spectrum at school for autism. They had said they were seeing signs of autism for him. And he was, worst of all, suffering every night from night terrors. And if you don't know what night terrors are, you're very lucky. It's a terrible thing to watch a child go through where they wake up in a half-conscious state screaming and terrified. And it can take hours to get them back to bed. I'm a bit of an optimist, and I knew right away that these things could change. And I knew the power of quality time and connection and our board meeting strategy, which until that time I had used with my own father for some cool stuff, but now I was in the role of the parent. So we started to do our board meetings, just Alden and I. And too much to talk about in a short interview, Shannon, but as you know, within one year, one year later, and these board meetings that we had, we did one once a quarter, just like most companies do. We all and I had our private time once a quarter together. That's it, and time in between, but this was the most important breakthrough times. Within one year, the school retracted the diagnosis of autism, which is very rare. That never happens. Yeah, and they admitted it was a mistake, and I knew it was. It was stress-related. It wasn't autism, but they retracted it. They admitted it was a mistake. He went from very close to failing to receiving the most improved student of the third grade, and he got the award at the end of the year. He was absolutely beaming. And then most importantly for me and and my wife, within one year, the night terrors were completely gone. Wow. And as Shannon knows, I can talk about this on a phone interview, but I'm standing in front of a few hundred people telling the story. I usually start crying on stage. Uh (laughs) So uh it's a little easier here in the office talking about it, but it was a very emotional thing. And seeing these results, you know, the power of quality time and connection and putting these simple things together to magnify the relationship and bring him out of his shell and let him know that he was safe forever, guaranteed. I couldn't just tell him that. I had to show him that and to have fun. The results are something that I just had to share with everybody because of how selfish would I have been not to share this painful story but the triumph at the end and let other parents create their own story like that. So it's one of the greatest gifts I think I can share, and as you know, I try to share it with as many people as I can. I love it. And I got to meet Alden, by the way, everyone. <laughs> and he's a very cool kid. And you'd never in a million years guess no. that that ever happened. He's a confident, out there, and just a very cool kid. How old is he now? He is 11, almost 12, and he'll be participating in this first board meeting this spring. So I'm excited. Yeah, and like you said, I could not line up the Alden of four years ago with the Alden today. There's just no way. It's a totally different young man. Totally different. 
Well, and how incredible to know that your relationship with him, you're creating connection, creating a safe environment, allowing him to trust again. Because if you can't trust the adults who are responsible for taking care of you, who do you trust? And even though you were newer to him as a parent, you stepped in and did that admirably. And one of the other things you talk about in the book is being vulnerable with him, with both Leland and Alden. And just being yourself and being genuine and that chance to kind of wrap up whatever the experience was with what did you get out of it and what was your favorite part of it and why is so powerful because it allows for that open communication, very simple, it's not complicated, it's not giving lectures (laughs) as you talk about, but just this real genuine connection between two people. And I think that's really what the board meeting strategy does. It does. It does. It's just, again, combining these three principles of a scheduled every 90 days board meeting, four hours uninterrupted, one-on-one, without electronics, doing fun activity with a focused reflection. And by the way, a fun activity, focused reflection, that is the shortest definition of experiential education I can use, (laughs) which is the best education on the planet, but very hard to put together, and that's why it's not always used. But doing these three things together, Shannon, they accelerate the strength of each other. And again, I see it now with people coming back to me two years, three years after doing these, saying things have completely changed between my son and I. Things have completely changed between my daughter and I. And it's just because there's consistency and we're giving that space to really have the deeper connection. And we're doing it in a fun way. These are not punishments. It's not like sitting through an insurance seminar. Sorry to any insurance people out there. (laughs) (laughs) Everyone knows they can be dry, yes. (laughs) So, but it's a fun way, and you're speaking the kids' language. You're doing fun on their terms, and people say, oh, well, my team won't open up. You will be amazed if you take four uninterrupted hours on a consistent 90-day basis, one-on-one, no phone, and then do something fun, and at the end try to have some conversation. What they'll open up about is stunning compared to what most people try to get their kids to open up during a rushed morning sitting at the kitchen table with phones going off and everyone running in a different direction. It's a total game changer. Mm, I love it. So one of the things that you really strongly recommend, because I really want people to leave knowing how to do this. Mm -hmm. I can feel the connection as you're talking about it, but I want them to know how to do it. So one of the things you say, which I really like, is that it's every quarter, which I think is a very fun spin on the board meeting (laughs) concept. You've made it much more fun than it ever was before, for which I appreciate. (laughs) But you don't leave one without having the next one scheduled. Yes. I love that. I mean, that which we schedule gets done. So, again, I'm speaking to a bunch of entrepreneurs right now. Could you imagine not scheduling your next board meeting with your internal team or that meeting you have with your largest investor client? I mean, you just wouldn't do it. You wouldn't say, oh, yeah, I'll get to it. No. Your child should be treated. I mean, that's one of our core rules is you should treat your children with the same respect and attention that you do your largest investors and your key team members in your business. So you need to schedule that. You need to space it out. You need to give them time to say, hey, we're going to be doing it this date. What do you want to do? So they have time to start anticipating it and getting excited. But that which we schedule, get done. So definitely schedule it the same way you would one of your important business meetings. I love it. And you have no problem pulling kids out of school. Absolutely. From one of your blogs. So (laughs) So Shannon, this will probably touch you, but... I'm sure with your dad, obviously a dad above dads doing these things years back, would you now, knowing like how time is fleeting, the time you spent with him, would you ever say today when he pulled you out of school for maybe your New York trip, would you say, geez, I really feel like my dad cheated me by having me miss that Friday of school? Heck no. (laughs) I was like, (laughs) can we leave on Wednesday? That would be my question. (laughs) And I appreciate school and I like it, but we have summertime and vacation, so we're talking about two days a year maybe they're getting pulled out. But there's something about breaking that hypnotic rhythm of normal work and normal school and feel like everybody else is at the grind and you're not. Mm -hmm. And I just feel that as important as school is, whatever we learn that day and our relationship deepening that day is way more important than what they could have learned at school that day. So I think it's a pretty cool thing. And again, with people say, oh, my teen will never do this, <laughs> maybe you say, look, we're going to miss a day of school and do something you want to do. I mean, you want to talk about a perk up. <laughs> it's a pretty good sales pitch yeah, I don't think uh, you'll to get trouble. things started. And the results are worth it to give that to them. So I'm not saying to miss school every week, but twice a year, maybe three times, 
I think the returns are much bigger for what we get done on that board meeting, just the two of us, than what could happen at school. That's just my personal opinion. I love it. And also, I imagine it once you have that quarterly section, I mean, I know this from my experience with Madison, it makes it easier to have the smaller times. But if you don't have those quarterly meetings of at least four hours, you don't actually ever get those. You know, in my case with Maddie, it's you know, driving in the car with the tunes that she chooses. They're not going to open up to you in between if you don't have those quarterly events either. Exactly. And my wife calls it the reset. She's like, oh, time mm-hmm. for a board meeting. You guys got to reset. If the boys are getting a little wild or antsy, boys will be boys. The board meetings really are a reset button. And like you said, Shannon, something happens where you have those strong pillars of relationship building, these fun moments of the board meetings, it makes the time in between each one that much more meaningful, that much more connected, that much better of a level of communication than if you didn't do them. I mean, these are really, again, I'm in the real estate world, so if you're going to build a house on the beach, you've got to have strong pilings, stakes going deep into the ground. And those pilings are what hold together the things that go in between. The same thing works for the results of a board meeting. I love it. And by the way... Jim has been very generous in sharing the book with the listeners, so we'll give you that link at the end. So thank you for that, or how to get it, I should say. So you've also given some top tips for a successful board meeting, and these really struck me as I reread the book in preparation for today about how not to mess it up. <laughs> and I, yes. always, I always like those guardrails because they keep me out of trouble. So what are some of the things so that we can have that really connected time, both in the quarterly meetings and in between, what are some of the ways to really stay on track and make sure that you are doing it, not to say the right way, but in the most effective way. Okay, so if you're going to do a board meeting, let's say you guys are out there listening to this and you say, I'm going to commit to this. I can do this. Once a quarter, I'm going to spend a half a day with each of my children, one-on-one, without the electronics, doing a fun activity of their choice. Hopefully you do. And if you do, from my own experiences and then experience of parents like Shannon and lots of others that I've interviewed and seen the results, I said, what are the biggest thing we can make a difference for to help each other make them even better or for people starting out? And we came up with five things to make the most of these board meetings. And the first, again, sounds too simplistic, but it's so important, and it's you have to be totally present. Got to be present, because if you're not present, the magnifying glass will never take shape and you'll never get what you're looking for, which is a deeper, more meaningful relationship with your son or daughter. So if you have an issue at work or if your son or daughter got in trouble last week at school, look, put it to the side. Be totally present. You can't be working your next business deal in your head if you're really going to be there for that board meeting. So you've got to be totally present. The next thing that I would say is really important is to drop your guard. See, when we're entrepreneurs, sometimes we're in the trenches, let's face it. So we're negotiating, we're selling, sometimes we're having to defend or make strong points. But this is your child. Again, you're not negotiating your next big deal. Drop your guard. Let them know that you're there for them and that you're vulnerable. Because I think vulnerability is one of the most powerful things that you can be. See, I refused with my boys to seem like Superman. They know that I have fears. They know that I have struggles certain days. I share that. And I've found that by being vulnerable and showing my vulnerability when we're talking at the end of our board meeting, Dad, have you ever been scared? Holy cow. Of course I've been scared. I can list five, ten things right away where they go, wow, I never knew you were scared for that. But you have to drop your guard. Be vulnerable. Did you have a comment on that? Yeah, you said something in the book which really resonated with me. Our kids think we're bulletproof. Yes. And it's yeah. true. And they look at us, we're confident, we're successful, we're going out in the world, people respect us, all this stuff, all the outward trappings of Jonathan and Rick. And they think they have to be that way too. Not realizing that we had to, in strategic coach, we call it the four C's, we had to make a commitment and then we had to go through the courage phase, which is not fun. That's the scary part to get the capabilities and the confidence that we have now. So they don't get to see the backstage of us very often Mm -mm. until you create an environment where that's actually the agenda. So I think the dropping your guard point, to me, that resonates along with being totally present so powerfully because I just know from my own kids that they think I came out this way. Ah, uh, no. It took, a, <laughs> it took a lot of work to get, to get this, let me tell you. The ability to be real with them and them to see me as a real person, because I don't want to be a role either. I don't want to be a thing. I want to be a, 
I'm, I'm Shannon. So I want to be that to them. And again, I just think it lessens their anxiety. It lessens their sense of perfectionism when they can realize that they can be real and will be real back. That creates yeah. a, an authentic relationship. It's one of the strongest commodities that you can use to grow with your child. It really is. You are not perfect. So drop the guard and let them see that and give exact examples of where you've messed up. Mm-hmm. People, oh, I don't want my kids to know that. Well, why? Why would they ever trust you to, to admit when they've messed up when they say, well, you wouldn't understand because you never have. So it really is a gateway to opening things to a whole new level. That's a great point. Both you and I know that now from experience. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the other ground rules or tips for making it work? Well, this one is one of my favorites because as entrepreneurs, we are all blowhards. (laughs) 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 And being parental blowhards sometimes, and I'm just picking some fun at all of us, we have the next 50 to 75 lectures planned of what we definitely need to tell our kids to put them on the right path to being better and improving and stop messing up. So the third rule, Shannon, is don't try to cram in a bunch of content on this board meeting. That is the instant way to shut it off. I understand we all have our next 50 lectures planned. Don't do it. Please resist. Keep it light. Keep the focus reflection light. Have a conversation, but don't lecture. Don't cram content in. It'll absolutely kill it, and they're not going to want to do another one. And it's not going to stick anyway. It's overload and not what the board meeting was all about. So don't cram in too much content. Yes, I just wrote down, it's a conversation, not a lecture. Exactly. Some people I know need to have that tattooed somewhere. (laughs) Really obvious. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. And I've been guilty of this. Remember, you're saying so much to your child just by the format you've set up without saying anything. Taking time out of work and out of school sometimes to spend this time one-on-one setting up something they wanted to do, honestly, there's not much you have to say because this quality time says it all. Mm, I love it. And that's really powerful. Again, sometimes, and I joke about uh, poking fun at all us entrepreneurs, but our motives are good. Sometimes we feel like we need to say something. I'm telling you right now, sometimes you don't. Mm. Good. Keep talking. (laughs) And with that, Shannon, one of the most powerful things, and this is something until you people out there start doing board meetings, you're not going to understand. But here's what happens. The fourth rule is don't hold back what you think you need to say. You say, well, well, hold on. You just said no lectures. Totally different. So I'm telling you right now, you set up this board meeting. There's been excitement to have it. You go through it. You have a fun activity with your child. You guys have a great time. You've been totally present. Then you go grab a meal usually, which is pretty standard for each one of our board meetings. And then after that, we spend some time someplace starting to talk. When you've gone through this and had the time of decompression and focus with your child, you are human and you love this person to pieces. And some moment of clarity is going to come up of something you want to say to them, some like very direct line of appreciation or love that you're feeling. But, man, vulnerability is tough, even with your child, and you're going to want to hold back from that. And I'm telling you right now, don't. Say it. Just say it. Because it could be the one line that connects the dots for your child, that throws them the lifeline for something that they're going through that you don't even know that they're going through and they needed to hear that, or could elevate them to the next level of what you are really wanting to see happen for them or simply just have the appreciation for themselves that they never realized you had for them. So that is so important, Shannon. I know you felt it. It's something that some of you out there, you're not going to understand until you put yourself in this position. But when you come to this point, say what you want to say. Just have the courage, say it. And again, Shannon, like you taught me with Dan Sullivan and said, courage feels crappy. And even with your young son or daughter, but just Mm -hmm. say it. I'm telling you, you will appreciate it. Mm, I love it. That's awesome. I know with my daughters, I kind of practice that. I try and practice that with almost everybody I meet. It's tough sometimes, but it can be really meaningful. And I was actually thinking as you're talking about my latest conversation with Madison. When I say those types of things that are heartfelt and real, and I'm very, very present, I'm very aware, and I usually just speak what's in my heart. And she's always so receptive. 
like there's never a time where she hasn't been. And then we exchange, you know, if I don't see her after that or if we go our separate ways and there's little hearts and emoticons in our texts and stuff like that. <laughs> it's really awesome. But I feel like there's a tighter bond there and I really trust her and she trusts me. My mom raised me, bless her, to really trust myself. And that's, I think, the greatest gift we can give anyone is the ability to trust themselves. And so when she knows I trust her, that allows her to trust her. And she knows who I will be in that situation to help her get there. So to me, it's just a very generous way to be with one another. I love it. Great. No, very good point. Uh, you showing that trust in Maddie gives Maddie really the space to be able to have the confidence to trust herself. Mm -hmm. And like you said, that is priceless. Totally. Absolutely priceless. So, totally. So that's it. And the final thing, the fifth one, which is, again, pretty simplistic, but so obvious, and so many parents don't do this, is simply have fun. If you want to talk in a child's language, especially the ones 15 and under, you got to be fun. I mean, who wants to hang out with a grumpy, fuddy-duddy adult? No one. No one at that age wants to. So whatever they've chosen, it might not be your favorite thing, but get into it. Enjoy it. Have fun. Be focused on it. Because when they see that, man, will they respond. If you don't get into it and you're holding back and, oh, yeah, you're just kind of waiting out the clock, oh, man, that is a huge strike against your relationship and your bonding. But if you just simply have fun and really get into it, wow, will they respond. And you're showing the highest form of respect. Really, I think you can show a child by saying, you know what, I'm going to drop my parent and serious world stuff right now and just completely have fun with you. As I'm listening to you, all I can think about is these are phenomenal cues, really, for any relationship. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, be totally present. Drop your guard. Don't cram in too much stuff. Don't tell people what you think they should be doing. Say what you're holding back and have fun. Sounds like a fabulous date <laughs> with your wife or your partner. <laughs> Sounds like a great way to be with your friends. I mean, these are just phenomenal relationship rules. And I think especially when we apply them to the parent-child relationship, it ups the ante because that relationship is often the most vulnerable to busyness and other distractions. And it's one of the ones that has the most important leverage in the sense that what we do with our kids, we only borrow them for a short period of time, and then they're out on their own. So what we do with them now matters for their future. And I like, because I've got to meet your family, you do this with your dad too, correct? With my parents now, and this is for people out there who have grown kids who are maybe over the age of 19, my dad and I try to do at least one a year. Now, mm -hmm. we do lots of times in between that, but we do about one a year. Because you find that away from your immediate family, to do more than that, and sometimes twice, we're living separate lives. But if we at least have that grounding at least once a year, sometimes twice, it works wonders. In this strategy, my dad is your classic stubborn old Irishman. As you know, Shannon, we went through a pretty strong bonding experience where I donated a kidney to him a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And without doing this strategy together, there's no way he would have ever accepted because he had every intention of not taking it. No way. You're not doing this. Mm-mm. But from spending one-on-one -on -one time together in this exact format, he opened up and finally accepted the gift, which was one of the best things I've ever done. So, so yeah, I use this in other circumstances, absolutely important relationships. It works very well. I love it. I love it. The next thing I want to talk about, and this is kind of deviating from the book a little bit, is if you want to supercharge your board meetings... You actually do it with Brian and Jim, which is really fun. So let's talk about board meeting retreats because you add to that and you have your six pillars of experiential learning, which I love. And part of the reason why I'm so excited to share this is because I've been on it. So I know exactly what the experience is like. And as we talked about earlier, Bruce and Charlotte are doing it shortly this year. So you're doing it May and October this year or November? We have one in May, which may be sold out as of today. I'm not sure. I have to check. Or we may have one spot left, and then we have one in October. Fantastic. So this is great because this is, as you said, when you fly down with your kid, and it's, again, one-on-one. -on -one, so it's not that you bring both your kids. I know one of the videos that I've watched that one parent had six kids. So the decision-making process to which kid was rather challenging. <laughs> but they decided, and it worked out. This is a chance to do this have a structured situation. And why don't you go through the six pillars? Because I think they're pretty spectacular. And they'd be better said in your words rather than mine. Sure. And the six pillars, again, speaking to a very entrepreneurial audience, these are the things that I thought not only when you share the learning of them together with someone, you grow the relationship, 
but also they're the things I thought that school was missing and had made a huge difference in my life. I mean, I'm very quick to say specialized events and masterminds, like a strategic coach format, which I consider a mastermind, they changed my life. They really gave me the direction I needed and the tools I needed to achieve and live the life that I wanted to live or am continually aiming to live. And so we figured, well, following experiential education's rules, we can make things fun and then have reflections to talk about them. So we came up with six pillars that we teach through our three-day event that we think are real important for children. And the first is a confidence mindset, because I believe with self-confidence, that inner clock, that inner compass, just makes the biggest difference for our children, to not only steer them in the right direction, but avoid the wrong direction. So pillar number one, and I think the one that most parents are most concerned with for their children, is confidence mindset. The second is entrepreneurial vision, because I think there's ways that we don't teach our children problem-solving skills or creativity enough. And one thing I'm learning with the world changing and the way things are happening and bigger organizations being taken over by smaller ones, most of our children are either going to have to become an entrepreneur or they're going to have to work for one. And they want to know how to think like one in order to make the most in the position that they take. So I think there's ways and fun ways, which we do at the retreat, as you know, Shannon, Mm -hmm. to teach kids entrepreneurial vision, which, again, I've heard a great definition. An entrepreneur is someone who takes responsibility for outcomes. It doesn't have anything to do with owning your own business, really, even. It's a mindset, really. So we go pretty deep into that. But, again, we don't do it in a lecture form. We do it in a very fun form where the kids don't even realize they're learning it until the end of the weekend. (laughs) And the third thing is financial empowerment. And I can tell you, when I graduated college, I was so unprepared for how to handle money. I had no idea. My financial intelligence was nil. And I was a business major, which is kind of scary. So I think I want my kids to work hard in life and to have some struggles that they have to stand back up from. But I don't want to make it impossible. And I honestly believe without financial intelligence, they're going to struggle. But with giving them financial empowerment with that certain rules and principles that they can learn at a young age, it makes a huge difference. So we do get into that as well. I want to jump in here because I learned so much from this one, by the way. And I thought I knew, like, I knew the event that we were doing, and I thought, okay, great, this will be easy. Well, I got some lessons I didn't expect to get. It was like, oh, I didn't know I could play the game that way, <laughs> you know, in the business game. So it was very educational. I mean, I want to stress to everyone that not only will your kid get a lot of this, so will you, because you will learn more either about yourself or your relationship or how you think about things or even, in my case, about financial literacy. It was awesome. And do you remember from my retreat, the people that were in it, that was so much fun. The community there was, I keep saying spectacular, but it was just amazing. One person said she learned more in that, was it four hours or three hours, than she had for her entire accounting degree. Yes, yes. Caitlin, I'm allowed to say her name because she's given full permission on that, but she was 22. And in her going into her final year of college, straight-A student, and playing this game for a few hours with business owners and entrepreneurs, she was just in shock of what she had learned in a few hours that she had never been grasped or taught at her university. And I'm not talking down her university, but that's just how she felt. And she had a whole new awareness, which was really exciting. That's funny you, you bring that up, Shannon. That's a big memory for me as well. Mm-hmm. And everyone was like, uh, yeah, because all of a sudden you got to see how it all fit together and how it worked in the real world. It wasn't abstract. It was concrete and tangible. And that made all the difference. It was fantastic. So what are the other three pillars? Conscious contribution. Now, this is an interesting one. Now, you know, Shannon, I've interviewed scores of entrepreneurs when we were designing the program and our board meeting strategy, you know, how's the best way we can help them? And asking some pretty potent questions, one of the concerns of most entrepreneurs we found was, I want my children to appreciate what they have. No one wants to raise the next Ebenezer Scrooge. No one wants to have a child that doesn't appreciate what they have. So we thought, how do we teach that? And as you know, most of you out there know, our theme is the ocean and surfing and fun water activities. Now, 95% of the people who come to our retreats have never surfed a day in their life. Everyone leaves surfing. That would be me. (laughs) Yep, that'd be Shannon. She caught plenty of waves. And everyone has some doubts in themselves, but we remove those doubts, which is part of the process. 
and everyone rides waves. We have a 100% track record. But the cool thing is for the first two days of our event, and I'll give away a little bit of the secret sauce of the event, is everyone learns to surf together and use the ocean together. The last day, we give back, and we bring in some very special people that we try to help. These are special needs people. They're also paraplegic and quadriplegic. And, yes, we bring them out surfing. And on the last day, we ask the kids, we say, we've given you our passion of the ocean. We'd like you to give it back to people that cannot enjoy it on their own. And they come in and they tell their story. And then for the morning, Shannon, it's my favorite morning of the retreat, hands down by far, our group brings out a group of special needs surfers. When we come in for the reflection, and Shannon will attest to this, she was in there, it worked like magic where we share, we have our focus reflection and everyone shares. At least four or five children said in one direct wording or a little, a little bit different wording, wow, I really have a better appreciation for what I have. And that was the whole goal. Now, if we had sat there and lectured to them, appreciate what you have. You need to appreciate what you have. Please appreciate what you have. <laughs> one ear and out the other, but to go through that and to see someone that... If they don't catch them when they fall off the board, they could drown. They have a focus. They have a wanting to help. And not one child ever in any of our retreats has ever said, when is it my turn to surf? They're always saying, can we take them for one more wave? Can we take them for one more wave? And it's pretty special. So that's conscious contribution is a responsibility of all parents, I think, especially as entrepreneurs. And that's something that we really focus on at the retreats. It's wonderful, and it's so fun to recognize. First of all, you've been taught how to surf, in my case, because I knew nothing about it, and I actually did get up. Just some many miracle, times you Miraculous. Got but yeah, Not and once, a, but many times. It's true, and Maddie and I were holding hands, our two separate boards. It was very cool. But, <laughs> but then to know that you can help someone else, and you can share that, and you can support them, and what it feels like to make that contribution was so fun. I love that part. All right, there's two more I want to make sure we touch on. Yeah, the last two are, the fifth one is quality connection. And again, this goes back to everything we've been talking about on the call. Connection is so important, Shannon. I mean, again, this is something that can be the difference in your health, purpose, and vitality compared to sitting around and smoking a pack of cigarettes every day. Connection matters. And the format that we have, again, one-on-one -on -one is not a punishment to leave the rest of the family out. But if you strengthen the parts, you strengthen the whole. And I know, like you said, Shannon, when you went home with Maddie, the relationship between Maddie and Charlie was better. Mm -hmm. And what we teach for how to connect better with each other, people are able to take home. So this is a huge pillar for us, huge. And then the final one is just energetic health. As you know, half the day we're out having fun. We're doing some stretching, doing some yoga, introducing some different physical activities because I know because I've been in great shape and I've been in awful shape. When you're in better shape, you work better. So energetic health is something very important for our children to get in the habit of now, and I think they're going to have a longer, happier life if they do. So we teach that in a very experiential way. No lectures at all on that. <laughs> and that's the whole thing. I mean, everything you've just talked about, you learn by doing. Mm -hmm. There's almost no lecture. <laughs> there's sharing, and there's collaboration, and there's contribution, but none of it is through lecture format, which I love because I hate lectures. I hate being in them, and I hate giving them. I hate's a strong word, but I intensely dislike them. <laughs> and so when <laughs> it's true, so when you, I hate them, I'm just going to say uh, I hate them. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, but let's agree on that one. I totally agree. <laughs> and so when it can be experienced and done. First of all, every entrepreneur in the world has learned by doing. You have what you think works, and then there's reality. And the marketplace very quickly educates you as to whether or not you're right. And so we learn by doing. And then to share, I think, that experience with our kids is like, I felt like, oh, my gosh, this is how I work. And so that's really a fun experience. And then, again, what you haven't talked a lot about, which I will briefly, is the quality of the people that are there. Who you and Brian attract, frankly, is wonderful. And I was so happy to be in that group of entrepreneurs to have Maddie exposed to that quality of people that you attract. I'm excited about that for Bruce and Charlotte as well. That impresses me. I love Strategic Coach in a large part because of with whom I get to work and who we attract. And you attract a very high quality level of person as well. So that to me is an enriching part of the experience that's really cool. So there's a community that goes along with it, which is awesome. Yeah. All right. It's one of our biggest compliments for people to share their greatest asset with us. And 
like you said, there's been a lot of strategic coach people, a lot of people from Joe Polish's 25K, and yeah, we feel very blessed at that. It's because of who you guys are, in my estimation. So how can people get the book? How can they connect with you? How can they find out about board meetings if they want to supersize it? <laughs> start off the right way like I did. Or not the right way, but just start off in a really cool way. How can they get in touch with you? How can people find out more? Great. Well, if you're interested in the retreats, just go to our website at www.boardmeetings.com. We'll talk more about the six pillars, see some of the people that you might know that have been to the event and just how this was all born. I go deeper into the story, but lots of good info that might be able to help you out. Love to have you sometime. And if you're interested in the family board meeting ebook, since you guys are friends with Shannon, and I like to give Shannon credit. She probably didn't think I was going to bring it up, but a <laughs> few didn't. years ago, she said, you need to write a book on this. Write it, write it, write it. And me being Mr. ADD entrepreneur saying, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I finally did it, and this book has become a calling card for who we are and what we're about. And it's making a huge difference, which just is so humbling for me. So since it's Shannon's group, you guys just email us at info at boardmeetings.com. And all you have to write is, Shannon asked me to get a copy of the family board meeting from you. And I will send you, our office will send you a free copy of the ebook. It'll take an okay. afternoon to read. But it's something that you're going to be able to use for the rest of your life. That I promise. Well, thank you. That's very generous to make it freely available. So thank you, thank you. And what I love is the book actually kind of captures in print form everything we've talked about. So in terms of the six principles and the three steps to connection, again, which is one-on-one, -on -one, no electronics, and have a fun activity with reflection, is all outlined with your amazing story about Leland and about Alden and about the wonderful Jamie, whom I adore. You'll really feel it as well as get the kind of guidelines to how to have those great board meetings with your kids. So a couple of things, Jim. First of all, thank you. Your generosity is awesome. Thank you. But also thank you for sharing your passion. And I know I love my family. And the two focuses in my life were my family and my work and the priority changes <laughs> depending on the day. <laughs> but what I really appreciate is actually having a structure. Like I can have every intention in the world and I can want to. I was raised by great parents. But knowing how to do it is often the hard part. And the fact that you have laid out a template with ground rules, what to do, what not to do, what to watch out for, how to do it, to me is just gold. And I really love that you've been willing to share it with everyone here because this is kind of the hard part sometimes. Some of us have gotten very good at the business side, but to get very good at the team at home is harder. And I think your, I would call your, your rules for connection, like being fully present and not having too much in your head <laughs> that you want to lecture at people is really key. Don't cram in too much. Have fun. All of those are really relevant to our most important relationships. And as you said at the beginning, if we win at business but fail at home, we're not going to be happy campers. We're not going to be fulfilled individuals. And I think we'll have missed a huge opportunity, which all of us hate doing. So this, to me, this guideline, this template for having really great board meetings, and you put such a great spin on board meetings, and I always think of surfboards now when I think of that, <laughs> is just fabulous. And the fact that it comes from entrepreneurial experience, and it comes from entrepreneurial wisdom, and all of your work with other entrepreneurs, as well as being a parent, both of you, yourselves, is so rich, and it's so integrous, and so connected, that to me, it just hits on all fronts. So that's why I was so excited to interview you today. So thanks for all the work you do, and thanks for investing the time today. I really appreciate it. No, well, thanks for having me on, Shannon. I really appreciate it. And it's always fun talking with you. So awesome. I, I appreciate the time together. Okay, great. Okay, everyone, again, so if you want a copy of the book, just mention my name and the Family Board Meetings book at info at boardmeetings.com and definitely check out the website. The Board Meetings experience for Maddie and I was transformational and a ton of fun, and there were no lectures. <laughs> <laughs> All of which was fabulous, and is, but really I think is a highlight in both of our lives. And so exactly. I really appreciate that. So thanks a million. Thank you, everyone. Hi, Shannon here, and thank you very much for listening. If you like what you heard today, please take a moment to rate the Team Success podcast on iTunes. And we'd love it if you'd share the podcast with anyone else who could benefit. If you're interested in learning more about the Strategic Coach program for entrepreneurs, visit us at strategiccoach.com or the Strategic Coach channel on YouTube. For free downloads and more team success strategies, visit teamsuccesshandbook.com. Mm -hmm.